let's get started. Uh, we have a word from our sponsors here. Let me just see if I can get up to find that here. Have anybody of you heard of Call for Code? This is actually an interesting uh, project we have in IBM and beyond where we have, as you know, in, we are inundated with natural disasters in the world. How do we as programmers, as developers, uh, write apps that can handle a crisis? I was involved in that 10 years ago. Can you hear me, by the way? No. That may be to my advantage, but... Uh, <laughs> can we get somebody to help me with that? Can you hear me now? I'd rather not use this because I'm going to be at the keyboard, but if there's no other way, then I will do like this. We'll see what we, how we can handle it. Okay. Ten years ago, we got involved in this thing with code, code for Code for uh, emergencies in the world. And we said, that's great. We have the internet and we'll write some apps that run on the internet and get hold of all the people who need help. And somebody told us, you guys don't understand there is no internet when there is an emergency. So doing this thing is, can, can be interesting to see what first responders, what networks they use, how they respond to emergencies and what apps do you can write to handle that. This is what this is all about. And uh, it is not something you have to endorse IBM for. You can do everything your own way. And we have URLs so you can go to. And if, when you go to the URL, you will see that there is all our open source code examples that you can use right out of GitHub. So this is something we think is neat for, for you to use. And therefore, we just wanted to let you know that this is there for you to use. So I'm a machine learning and blockchain developer advocate based in San Francisco. And this is one of the largest audiences I could possibly imagine. So this is uh, great. Uh, I just came back from Seattle, where I visited my son, my daughter-in-law, and my 16-month-old granddaughter, who is bilingual and actually shows signs of great intelligence. She speaks English, two words, mama and dada. And then she speaks sign language, about 200 words. So I wanted to test her, and I, t I began by saying, where is mama? And he, he, she pointed to her mother. Where is Tara? She pointed to her father. And then I said, where is Nessa? Her name is Nessa. She put up her finger like this, what she does when she's thinking, and then she did like this, which really impressed me, 16 months old. In talking about intelligence, we are going to talk about IBM and AI. IBM has been in the AI game for quite a while. I was involved in, with Deep Blue way back in 1996. I came here in uh, 1987 to do AI. Then came the AI winter and everything stopped. Then we came back with Deep Blue. And uh, that was a great project to be involved with. I didn't do any of the coding or anything like that. I was just involved with it. Then came uh, Watson Jeopardy, that I'm certain you've heard of, that used unstructured data to analyze what we talk about and what we say. And actually, it was the beginning of the modern AI movement. Then we have computer vision that IBM has been involved in. When did computer vision start? Does anybody, can anybody think of that? What date would you think it started? Serious research into computer vision. 1975? 1960. So it's been around for a very long time. And now it is the leading AI trend, shall we say, is computer vision. And we're going to talk something about that here in a second. We also have something else that happened, by the way. Uh, on May 23rd, 2017, Google's uh, Go, Alpha Go program beat the world's champion. It's actually not the world champion, but the best player in the world. And that was another great movement in AI, for, with AI artificial intelligence, in other words. And what do these three things have in common, these three milestones have in common? Can, can somebody spot the common trend? Enormous amounts of, of, of uh, social media attention will fall upon the one person who can answer this question correctly. They all deal with games in various. And that is kind of interesting, isn't it? That the games have been driving the AI movement, like nothing else. And I'm not sure why necessarily, but that's what is happening. And you're going to see there is a tag line to this thing that is coming. All right. So we have AI services. 
And where do we go to get hold of those AI services? And the answer is, we go to where? Where do we go? So if you now wanted to, do, to begin to work with Watson Visual Recognition, where would you go to do that? Where is Watson Visual Recognition based, hosted? Yes, very good. In which cloud? Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The, uh, there are similar services in AWS and Google Cloud and Azure as well. So I'm not necessarily super patriotic here. These, these are, this is, is, is all over the map, so to speak, all over the world now. But here is the interesting thing. We, you and I, and anybody with a simple credit card can get hold and begin to use these visual recognition apps in the cloud now if we wanted to. If you pulled out your credit card and your laptop, you would have this up and running in within five minutes, say. Why is that so specific or so ama amazing? Because there is no, no longer any hurdle to using visual recognition or the other services from any cloud provider. The cloud is what makes them e easily available. And even if we may not be, be able to run some one of these services forever, we can run them for long enough. We can run them for an, a day, and uh, an hour if we want to. We can run it for a week. It, they, it's available to all of us here. There is no reason for us to say that we are, I, I don't know where to go for, for running these services and so forth and so on. I don't have the money. We all can do it, even if we have a lot less money than we have here. This is the first thing I'd like to leave you with, so to speak. Now we'll see if I can do this and program at the same time. If you'd like to follow along here, you can just Google visual recognition, Watson. And this is something I wish you would do because it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to sign up for anything. It is just out on the open internet. Here we have it. You can, you know, that's a good point. I should have thought of that. Uh, that was one of the tests we didn't run. I blame other people completely. But anyway, I can talk to it. We're now running the real test here. And you can see we have something called a general model where we can spot that this is fabric, gray color, hair is tweed, etc., etc., that we can see. And the model, which is a machine learning model, has been trained on an, in a number of areas, and it can be come up with this kind of response, which I think is pretty neat. And now I'm going to uh, do a quick change here. Here you can see another test. Okay, 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 okay. I, this should be, okay, all right, okay, we have to go without that. It's frozen, yeah. Let me just do this and reboot. Uh, okay, we'll go. Yeah, we'll go with this the way it is. The important thing here is that there are things here that makes this thing so amazing. Uh, in that the price here is very, very small, very low and that you then can have, you can upload images any number you want to, or you could have put add them in the URL. And you could actually, again, if you wanted to create something, a real valuable application, say, in a couple of hours. This is not just a, to, a, a statement for IBM. This is an AWS and the other cloud service providers have the same uh, offerings as well, very similar. How many people here are, have done something like this already? Very good. I urge the ones of you who did not raise your hand to do that when, you're, when we finished here. Mm. 
Here we have a number of other services the same way. Speech to text. Can you think of a use case of speech to text? I could not, I do hackathons. And two years ago, I talked to a young lady who came up to my booth who said she is a nurse in Southern California. And she wanted to do speech to text. And she was ready to start a company with it because it was so amazing, she said. And I said, speech to text, that's kind of boring, isn't it? Somebody speaks like me and you generate text. Why would anybody want to do that? Yes. Search. Yes, search is one thing, but one more thing. This is a hospital setting. There's a nurse involved and there's a patient involved. Why, would you, why is speech to text so enormously important? Yes. Because the, the patient probably points to devices and he cannot just start uh, typing or communicating, sending email or checking. So another, another very good use case, but the use case she had in mind was when, when yes. Take notes. Take notes, yes, but when and why? The, doc, uh, the doctor mm. giving instructions. More than that. But if in operating theater, yeah, you see, there are lots of use cases. The one she had in mind there was a little bit of twist to what you're coming up with. When you release a patient, the release nurse has to sit and talk to the patient and say, how was your visit? What, what did you think about it? And when, when the patient answers, she has to type it on the computer. With this service itself, she could get rid of the typing. And the patient would talk directly and she would get text out of it. And she has subsequently started the company on that. That shows you how a very simple cloud-based AI uh, service can mean nothing to most of us. I certainly would have never thought of that, but other people can say, that is a lifesaver for me, and it is also very cheap to create. So think of it in those terms as well. This is something, these services are really good to know about. And Tone Analyzer, this Tone Analyzer. That allows you to analyze my tone of speaking. If I don't like what I'm talking about, I may sound very angry. Or if I like something, I may sound very happy and very nice, uh, which I usually am anyway. But the point here is that you can have this at the call center and see what the people who call into the call center, how they feel. If they are mad as hell, so to speak, it will come out by the tone, not by their language, by the tone of the voice. You can, you can analyze that. So there are a num very large number of these services. What's an assistant demo? It's used for chatbots, which are becoming more and more important. In IBM, we use chatbots now internally a lot. Instead of me calling somebody up, I talk to a chatbot. That actually, that actually gives me the same information that I would have before from a human being. Personality insights is another one where you can analyze somebody's personality, which is being more and more used when you hire people. So be aware. Be at your best behavior. Discovery news, you can analyze news and see how, how for instance, IBM is being perceived in the, in the marketplace or how we are being perceived in the marketplace. Now we come to something very, very important. And there's a twist to this thing, so pay, please pay attention. IBM recently created or built Summit. Have you heard of that computer? That is the fastest computer in the world, beating the Chinese for the first time in a long time and making all the patriots east and west of the Rocky Mountains go wild. But there's a twist to this news. You notice it's no longer IBM's computer. It's IBM and NVIDIA's computer. This is the first time this has happened. So what has NVIDIA to do with IBM's supercomputer? This is no longer a supercomputer of the classical type. It is a supercomputer of the new type, an AI supercomputer that also can do classical calculations on weather forecasts and things like that. AI is changing IBM and it's changing the US and it's changing the world. And we see that here. And why do we see that? Not just because of NVIDIA, but because of the graphical processing units, the GPUs, that are now the cornerstone of AI. You might spend your lifetime working in AI and never do any coding, but only work on hardware. And what you would work on would be GPUs and surrounding technologies. This is very, very important to understand. And you don't hear that as much about this as you ought to, 
So here, for instance, you know, here, each node is equipped with six NVIDIA Volta tensor core GPUs, delivered total output, etc., etc. This is as much as, as, as an AI computer as anything else we've had before. And the Chinese will retaliate, as we can expect them to do, because they have some very smart AI people as well. And, but this will be a GPU battle. Exactly what makes the GPU so in, enormously important, I must admit, I am not certain of. I haven't studied up on that. But it is true, nevertheless, that that is what is, is makes AI possible today, and especially over, uh, advanced at such a rapid pace. So GPU and machine learning. Like most machine learning algorithms, deep learning relies on sophisticated mathematical and statistical computations. ANNs, CNNs, RNNs, each have certain needs that GPUs, cloud servers, can fulfill. And now those of you who, who are really ambitious say, this is interesting, I'd like to play around with the GPU, and I'd like to write a simple AI program, and I'd like to do it now. Enough of this talking. Where do you go to begin to build your application? No, this is not. Uh, I, I can do better than that. I can make you think IBM without you realizing it. But that's not what I'm here for. I'm a developer advocate, and we do not, are not supposed to do that. You go to the cloud. That's my spiel here, so to speak. And I think it's an important thing to remember that, that the, it's like going to Fry's Electronics. If you want to do something, you go and see if it is in the cloud. And look, there it is. This is the IBM cloud now, and that's the cloud I work with. As I say, I'm certain we have similar offerings in the other clouds as well. We can get a small Power AI version 1.5.1 with IBM Power 8, 1x NVIDIA P100 GPUs with NV Link per node for $2.15 per hour. That is not that bad, is it? Medium, 4.30 an hour, and large, 8.16 an hour. And for really large ones, you can get special quotes for that. But that's how you do it. And look here now, import from cloud object storage. I have said no, that was a mistake, it should say yes. You can now, now dump 10,000 images in cloud object storage and have them read in by the Power AI and GPU service that you just provisioned. Is this cool or isn't it? This is how you work today. Everything you need typically is in the cloud. Now, you may, if you're picky, what do you say if you're picky here? If can, if, I don't know if you can read this thing, but let me read it again. Power AI version 151 and IBM Power 8. What would make you say, well, that's not cool enough? It's Power 8, not Power 9. It's not the very latest. But it's good enough for testing, and it's good enough for writing real applications. But this is a story I came here to tell you about, that we can all do a lot of things for, very, for a very low price by looking at what's in the cloud, any cloud. And by the way, it's very good if we know more than one cloud. So I'm not saying that you should just you know, stare yourself blind on one cloud. Look at the cloud, see what's there. Look on GitHub, look on Medium, which is a very good news source for tech news now these, these days, and see what you can build. And you'd be surprised at how, 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 uh, what you can build. My son, who lives in Seattle, as I think I pointed out, he just bought a doorbell that is programmable, and he's now going to see if he cannot uh, program in here pictures of all his friends and enemies, so he knows who, who pre presses the bell. And uh, using cloud. And here comes another thing. This now is a plug for IBM, but it's a good plug. We have something called Power AI, the Power AI platform. That's a risk platform. And look now what we have done. This is, again is a new world. We are totally open source here. We have TensorFlow, Cafe, IBM Cafe, Watson APIs, large model support, et cetera, et cetera. This is an open source statement. We're taking all the open source uh, libraries, the machine learning libraries, and bundling them up with the, with the best iron we have, the big iron, the power AI. And you can just spin, spin that up from the cloud. Everything is there. No need to install any of these special libraries. 
by, by themselves. They are there. We have consul. You can begin to work with them right this way. Or right this time, it should be. But I, I think this is pretty amazing. We are actually working with Google on TensorFlow, since we're both using it. And today, this is an, an open source world. So the cloud is one component that makes this grow like you wouldn't believe it. The other component is open source. Everything here is open source. All the libraries are open source. And why is it so important to be open source? I'll tell you a funny story. We have departments in IBM that work on open source. They do open source. So one of the managers said, that's great. You know, now, guys, we are going to do work on open source on this project we're working on. I think it was blockchain, but it might have been something else. And he said, uh, we, what we, ha we have this pr project we have to complete now here first. Let's do that. And can we do a drop one month from now? And people told him, sorry, but you don't understand. We don't call the shots anymore. We're open source. We have to check with everybody else in the open source group that does this, even outside IBM. And it took them quite a while to realize that they had lost much of the power by going open source. This is a totally different way of working than before. And these frameworks, therefore, are also is, are the cornerstones of machine learning. That's what everybody's using. Where do they come from, typically? What are the, two major, the one major source of these frameworks? Universities, and especially Berkeley. This is really, machine learning is really a Silicon Valley story because of a number of reasons. The first one is Berkeley, the second one is Stanford, and then we have all the companies in between. We are the leaders here, by far and wide, and this is really, it's just because of two universities, two very good universities, but anyway. I'm going to go uh, into another part of my presentation. We talked about Watson for Jeopardy. It became, it forked and became Watson for Healthcare, Watson Service in the IBM Public Cloud. We covered the latter. We will know how to get there and take a look, and I know, I know you will do that at some point to take a look at what we have in the public cloud. But Watson for Healthcare is not in the public cloud. Why not? What prevents it from being in the public cloud? HIPAA, yes. It would be totally impossible. If some, anybody tells you it's, in, uh, it's HIPAA compliant, they are not telling the truth. Now, uh, this is a screen capture. You may not be able to read it, but I will tell you what it is. How artificial intelligence will change medical imaging. So we have here a collaboration with IBM Watson and the German uh, company Agfa. And what we see here is a radiology workflow. Watson reviewed the X-ray images and the image order and determined the patient had lung cancer and the cardiac history and pulled in the relevant prior exams, sections of the patient's history, cardiology and oncology departments, pulled in the relevant prior exams, etc. So we are vacuum the world looking for and pulling in all the data that has anything to do with this patient and munching it all together, if you will. And this is how Watson is changing healthcare. This is not something that you can get in the public cloud for obvious reasons. These are special bid contracts with various hospitals. But this is a very interesting way of working uh, for machine learning as well, especially how artificial intelligence here is being deployed in hospitals all over the US and in other countries as well. This is a very, very big thing. And by the way, if anybody wants this presentation, just send me an email and I will get, give it to you. So here we have other Boston for Healthcare uh, um, sections for drug discovery, social program management, oncology we mentioned, and care management. Always, if I'm the patient, they will take a look at all the details they can get from me, all the data they can get from me all the data, data they can get from my, my parents, my children, and any kind of and, uh, any journal articles that have been written about my situation, and just vacuum everything up, and then analyze it. This is an immense operation. And this is, you might even call it brute force medicine, but it is actually paying off, and it's changing the way where healthcare is managed. 
So data and healthcare. Keep in mind when we talk about uh, data science and when we talk about I, uh, AI and machine learning, we talk about data. Everything is data. So when IBM uh, acquired Truven Health for $2.6 billion a while ago, it was all for the data. Patient records. We got 200 million patient records that we then can anonymize and analyze and come up with new machine learning algorithms. So big data is what feeds machine learning. And without big data, as I'm certain you know, there would be no machine learning. So this is a very exciting aspect of, of, of machine learning. Now here comes a story that is one of the major stories this year. It has nothing to do with IBM, but it is a, a generic, generically very interesting story. You may remember this, you should be, because it caused quite a stir. Deep learning in radiology. This was a group of Stanford professors who was able, were able to prove that the convolutional neural network trained on the chest X-ray, the largest publicly available chest X-ray data set, were able to outperform human doctors. They were able to train this model and then they ran the model against the, the, the uh, X-rays and they were able to find that the chest checks net exceeded average radiologist performance on the average on the F1 metrics. If this was true, which is kind of is, it would mean that X-ray radiologists would be put out of business. At least they would not be as important as they are. Is that true or not? Now, if you and I saw this thing, we would say, well, it must be true because Stanford, I mean, you know, they are the leading in a, leaders in AI. But in point out, turns out that it is not necessarily true, at least not totally true. And the reason is uh, that what they're doing is looking at X-ray pictures. What are they not, lo not looking at? The clinical records. I, well, I was in London, Ontario at the university there last year, working with the uh, neurologists there, and they did exactly the same thing. They would take pictures of the images of the brain and compare to find uh, uh, problems in the brain. Disease, various diseases, various things that, that didn't work correctly. But they never thought about the patient himself or herself. It was just a matter of image recognition here. And that's what this is going on here as well. They were comparing images and they found out that the system itself, the machine learning algorithm, was able to outperform the human doctors. And there were a number of problems with that study. One of them was, again, that there was no information from the clinical data. There was nobody who was sort of asking, this, this lung image, from what patient does it come? What patient, what other diseases might the patient have? And that is really where a radiologist of the old school, shall we say, find, you know, find their, their answers. And this was a big discussion then on Medium. And it turns out that the Stanford group was not totally correct. And they got quite a lot of, of uh, criticism. This is not a matter of totally true and totally, fa totally false. But it, it, what it means is, and this is something, I, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because this was the biggest AI story probably this year. This is very, very big. And it caused a lot of discussion. It was not a clear-cut out, outcome. And if you can read through here and see exactly what the criticism consisted of, you will realize that the Stanford group probably was quite too ambitious and didn't quite present their findings correctly. Yes? So based on the AI learning uh, uh, x-ray images for right. the doctors, do you think the AI is already trained based on the other images, not based on the... A sample set. They have a, so when you work with machine learning, you always start with a big data set or some form. And they had that data set, there was a, uh, the chest x-ray, chest uh, checks net, was the big data set they had. They took a part of that and trained the, the algorithm and then they got the model. They ran the model against new data and they turned out that they had com made some questionable assumptions, shall we say, 
And the reason, my reason for pointing this out is that machine learning is very complicated. The methodology itself is, is quite straightforward, but you cannot I cannot take your x-ray and say, you have a certain disease, or vice versa. It is dangerous that we think that if we do that, yes, I mean, clearly, you, you, we, I may have a disease that shows up in an, an x-ray. But there are also other facts outside of the image itself that play a very important role. And that is the reason why this caught my attention, because it is a fantastic story. And the Stanford people were very, very open and said that if I made any mistake, we'd correct them, and they made a number of corrections. Uh, so there's not, uh, no contention here, but it just shows that it is not as easy as one may think all the time to, to uh, do machine learning. Machine learning and big data. I put in this thing because I think it is kind of neat. The sexy job in the 21st century, and this is the truth. This is the true story. If you suddenly were to start doing machine learning here, you would start by cleaning data, which is ugly and dirty and filthy, and utterly boring. Machine learning and deep learning. The, the nomenclature here, what you call the various things, is not really very important. But we have artificial, artificial intelligence is the umbrella name. Machine learning comes then. Like Netflix video recommendation, Facebook facial recognition, not very advanced, and the most advanced is deep learning. Self-driving cars and speech recognition, etc. But don't be hung up on that. Don't criticize your neighbor or best friend because they use the term strongly. And if somebody tells you that you use the term wrongly, tell them that you know what you're talking about. Tell them you, you check with your machine learning buddies and get back to them. Convolutional neural networks. If you're interested in neural networks, you should study convolutional neural networks. That is where the, where the, where the hottest stuff is going on today. Everyone, is, is, including IBM, is working on these. And uh, exactly what this con entails is hard for me to explain because I'm not sure I can explain it in, very well anyway. But I was at a, conver uh, at a conference, an AI conference in San Jose a couple of six weeks ago. And everybody was talking about convolutional neural networks. This is the hottest thing. And again, the, the, the thing here is that it's easy to get started. Anybody can get started here very easily. But once you get a little bit into this field, don't be, don't be surprised if you suddenly say, my god, I have no idea what these people are talking about. The, the, the people who are in this field are not paid the salaries they're paying because they have a pretty face. They really have to know what they're, what they're talking about. But at the same time, machine learning is changing the world. And here again, we have these machine learning libraries. Cafe, Theano, TensorFlow from Google, Spark, Keras. And I want to bring your attention to the Stanford EDU. Let me see now if we can get this guy up here, because this is something you should Can we see that? No. Oh, OK, it's different. OK, I'm sorry. There's something different with the display here. Simply uh, ask me for this slide, because they have a very, very good set of slides on machine learning at, at the Stanford EDU. And as you know, they work very closely uh, with Google. Several of their professors are Google uh, VPs and, and such. And such. Uh, on the other hand, Stanford has not been as good as Berkeley as, as creating libraries themselves. Berkeley is much long far ahead there, and I'm not sure why that the difference is, but it is a, there is a difference. But this is absolutely first rate slides. If I could scarf them, I would, but I can't. And here we have one of the, the frameworks, the CAFE framework, developed at Berkeley. In CAFE's first year, it has been forked by over 1,000 developers and had many significant changes contributed back. That's a lot of attention. This was a PhD, this was a PhD thesis originally, and speed makes CAFE perfect for research experiments in the industry. CAFE can process over 60 million images per day 
with a single NVIDIA K40 C GPU. See, everything comes together. Here we have the GPUs, we have the open source frameworks, and we have machine learning. All of it work working together. IBM has now t taken a step in the right direction and created something called Watson Studio. So whatever you want to work on AI in IBM, you, uh, in the cloud, you start with Watson Studio. Speed it up, doesn't cost you anything, and you can begin to work and then go either into uh, you know, AI, into machine learning, or any other area of, of, of AI you want to. But so we have a very different, nice, nice user interface starting with the Watson Studio. And that's, I wrote an article on that in Medium, if you want to take a look at it. And the Watson Studio is in the cloud. You simply spin up an image, and you're up and running. Again, everything is in the cloud. The studio is there. You can begin to work with it and create your own images. Very, very easy to work with. And here you can see, you can use it to refine data. You can create a notebook, deep learning, new modeler, and new models. This is a very, very good thing to know. And if we have a session here in a couple of months, I'd like to do a session on Watson Studio because it is really, really worth knowing and you can do some pretty neat things with it. Before we had different services by themselves, not coordinated, now everything is coordinated through the Watson Studio. Yes. Sorry, what, what, so what is Watson Studio? Watson Studio is, think of it as a GUI. Okay. You go in there and then you decide what you want to do. You don't have to decide beforehand what you want to do, but you go into the studio. It's like, like one of the old-fashioned GUIs if you, win, if you want to. And then from there you then decide, for instance, to, to work on a neural network and you begin to create that one, or you create something in R or whatever you want to do. Okay, so it provides some of the components for you. Exactly, right. And we, yeah, this is text. Deep learning in Watson Studio. We just mentioned Watson Studio. We have an experiment assistant that can, you can do cross-model performance in real time and uh, help you with that. Open and flexible, elastic GPU, GPU compute. I mentioned that you can get GPUs then connected to Watson Studio and really pump it up. And neural network modeler. Now here you know for the first time in, in the Watson cloud here, you can create your own neural network model it on your own. If you really want to do some heavy duty stuff, that is what you can do now. It's in beta still, but it's really still already very useful. So the thing is find the learning path you want to go through and Watson Studio then is your, the, the tool you should use. And here we have the network modeler. And this is the way, the way it looks like when you begin to create the real neural network, but I don't think uh, one can do that without having some exper experience ahead of, ahead of you. But it's there if you want to use it. And here we have a graphical picture here of the Watson Studio. Kubernetes containers are there, multi-frameworks, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe, Keras, the ever-present GPUs I mentioned. And this then is the stack you get if you go into and begin to use Watson Studio. And other providers have similar software as, as well, of course. But that's how you work in this space. The Watson Knowledge Catalog. What we have now also created is we have, the, we have learned now that everything is, deals with models. I don't want to create my own model. I don't want to have to create from scratch. I don't want to have to create a neural network from scratch. I want to pick up existing models and trade with you. I provide them, you take them. They're all open source. And this is the big thing now that IBM is into. And we're not the only ones. Model asset exchange. So we create the models, machine learning engines like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Cafe. We have a standardized approach to classifying them, and then we can trade them on the open market, just like old-fashioned class libraries. This is the latest 
in machine learning. Uh, I've got a question. Yes. Did you say, is there like a, a marketplace to sell? Yes, there is. It, it is. it is exchange them. The idea is you, you, what, you need a model and you go to the exchange and you see what's there. If there's something that you can use, then you can take it and use it. They should, they should be open source. I must admit I haven't actually checked. Here you have an example of what, what it looks like. We have Inception, RESTnet v2, Places365, CNN, Image Caption Generator, et cetera, et cetera. And we have the URL there as well. So I could upload my model and... That's the whole idea. The idea is that some people are really good at creating models. Maybe you have to create a model. And you say, well, you know, there is nothing proprietary here that I cannot share. You can share it, and you can then get something else for that. The whole idea is that go up the food chain. Don't get stuck at the very bottom. Use the cloud, the tools in the cloud. Pick things up like models, and, and then work at that level. Because this is too complicated to try to do everything. You have to select the components you need yourself and then see if you can get them from somebody, just like you do in GitHub. Yes? So the challenge, is it more like the business case, like what kind of data you have, what kind of models you have, and what is the outcome? That's a very good point, a very good way of expressing it. Yes, it is. Because, because again, uh, I don't think one should stare oneself blind, so to speak, at the technology. You're right. You have a business case. And then the first thing is, what, what can I reuse? The first thing you need is a large data set, like for this chest x-ray. Uh, everything is driven by very large data sets of patients, of, of consumers, of whatever. And then you have to make certain you can scrub that, and then you create a model out of the data set. Now you have the model, you can test the model. And then you say, this looks, works pretty nicely. I'll um, open source it. Because if you open source it, you get like cafe. Other people will use it and you will maybe become a rock star. If you don't open source it, nobody will know about you and nobody will care. Everything is open source. Like, like for example, I read a news, like let's say uh, Google also have an image recognition. Yes. So Disney pay them to use that cloud service. So therefore, all the Disney merchandise, right. they could auto tag it. So that for them, the business value is that people will search in the online store and they'll be able to yeah, I think the, the important thing I think here is that open source is something that we all realize. Uh, a manager I'm working with in IBM was given the question, asked the question, why, why do you want to use open source? Don't you have enough programmers in IBM to do it yourself? And he said, I could possibly get 10 IBM programmers to work on this thing. That's the budget I will get. With open source, I can get 100. What would you choose? There's another thing that is equally important. Nobody wants to work for, work for a company that doesn't do open source. Because when you go to your next company, they will ask you, what, show me your GitHub repo. If you say, I can't because everything I do is, co is confidential, your chances of getting a job are not that good. And they're not impossible, but they're not that good. So all companies want to, you know, want to be with it. They want to be, have GitHub repos, which they all have today, or most of them have. And that's just the world we live in. And the same is true of machine learning. It is an open source world in machine learning. And if once you get that, as you pointed out, once you see what the use case is, go and learn how to get components, put them together, use the cloud, build something up very quickly, fail fast, you've gotten the hang of it. And you can probably accomplish a whole lot of things more than you ever thought you could. This is very exciting. And much, much more exciting than before when I started out writing compiler code, which was not something I want to remember ever having done. And then we have a uh, fiddle. This is the part of deep learning, training and model management, TensorFlow, etc., Kubernetes, GPU, CPU, NFS support. It's a stack. And we have then uh, the fabric for, de for deep learning. This is kind of a website we have where all the components are listed and where you can go and get, get them and reuse them and so forth. Very, very important initiative from IBM. We also have here a number of sample applications, patterns as we call them, that you can take and build these things from scratch. They're all up in GitHub. And if you want to build something more, more on your own, you can take this and just, just deploy it. It runs out of, out, of, out of the package, out of the box, 
and you can deploy it, and you can then begin to change it. And with our blessing, we want you to take it, we want you to, to copy it, we want you to change it. The more you change it, the, the happier we are. This is a very, very important aspect of this thing, these, these patterns, code patterns. We have people up in San Francisco who do nothing but that, and also in Austin. And we use them all the time ourselves. So all the pieces are here, all the pieces are here for you to use. And just remember where to look and take a Stanford class or two and you will be on your way to more money you have ever, than you have ever dreamed. <laughs> well, I, I think that way, I'm sorry. <laughs> and here are the code patterns for AI. These really are important because again, they're all there, they are, doc they are documented, you can see them and you can begin to take a look at them and, and work with them. This is a treasure trove, actually, uh, and all we're asking is that you use them. But you don't have to, of course. So this is my appeal to you to get started. You may already have been doing this thing. Take a Coursera EDX course. Look at the IBM model asset exchange. Take a look at Kaggle, where they have lots of data sets. Data sets is the starting point. If somebody says, can you help me with do, to do this machine learning algorithm, machine learning model, say, what is the data set? You have to have a data set. And the good way to start doing, doing a machine learning is to just learn how to, to wash data sets. It's like learning how to wash patients in hospitals. My father was a doctor and my mother a nurse. And there was something he, she learned to do. It's the same in, in, in washing the code washing the data sets. Because they are not correct all the time. 99% of them may be correct, but then there are errors. A field may, supposed to, may be supposed to consist of an int, because instead it consists of a double. You have to change that and, and, and scrub it, and then you show it to the data scientist who send you back to the wash basin again. Deep learning, what's in machine learning? Take a look at everything we have to offer, take a look at what others have to offer, and uh, Come back and do, with some luck we may have another session like this in a few months' time. Yes? I just want to add that uh, tonight at 9 o'clock there is a Discovery Channel program that IBM Discovery Channel had put together a documentary called This is AI. Okay, great. That's, at, that's mm -hmm. tonight at 9 p.m. Excellent. So two hours on. Very good. Any questions? If not, then, then I'll hand over to Maya, I think, or... Oh, yeah, no, wait, 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 wait. Don't come yet, Maya. Wait. Here. Okay. She promised me to put this up. And I'm so scared of her if, if I didn't do that, that you wouldn't believe it. These two links, click on these and you will become happier than you've ever been before in your life. <laughs> these links are on the cards that are on the seats. Uh, so... Don't have to take a photo, but if you didn't have a card on your seat, please feel free to take a photo. Yes, and just, we want to see all the cameras up now. All the cameras up. So, far, sir, you know, get the start of the slides. Yes, so everyone who's registered, I'll be sending you a follow-up email. That's why we collected your emails. It's the only email you'll get from us. We will not spam you, we promise. <laughs> um, and next, we're going to be handing it off to our lovely H2O speaker. Yes, exactly. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm glad you guys all showed up. This is uh, really exciting for me. Um, first, first time seeing a couple hundred people in a room all staring at me. So, <laughs> um, good luck. So, what we're going to do today is just a quick introduction on H2O, and that's that's the company as well as the product. So what is H2O? Uh, who is H2O? So we're a company, we were started in 2006, and uh, we've raised a fair amount of money, and I'm sure you guys are all curious just how much, um, but we're not gonna get into that. Instead, we're gonna talk about just who we have. Uh, we have a team of 
five of the top 10 Kaggle grandmasters in the world. And as you know from Leonard's speech, uh, Kaggle is very important in data science. Uh, we also have a ton of top tier talent from you know around the Bay Area that is is uh, you know specializes in sales, you know operations, engineering, which is the most important part here, I think. Um, we have a couple products. We have our open source as well as our closed sourced or enterprise product, which is um, which is driverless AI. Our open source is H two O, and uh, we'll be getting a little bit further into that uh, a little bit down the line. And we have a couple. Um, uh, a couple offices around the world, inclusive uh, Mountain View, London, uh, Prague, to name a couple. Um, and our uh, and recently, we actually just had a uh, uh, our score in the Gartner Quad, uh, Magic Quadrant actually put us as one of the uh, top in the uh, Magic Quadrant for uh, completeness of vision, of vision as well as innovation. So um, this is a, another slide on that. <laughs> And it's going to tell us a little bit more about um, just how well we are doing. Um, H2O um, customers actually gave us uh, one of the highest scores in customer support. And um, I think that it's a great thing that we are so responsive to the customers that, that we have and, and the community. I'm, I'm so, so glad to see so many of you guys out here, actually. So um, this is just a quick overview of our uh, product suite. Um, so as you can see on the left, um, your left, not mine. There is the open source products, which include HTO for GPU, sparkling water, and H2O. Uh, basically, H2O for GPU is GPU optimized H2O. Sparkling water is H2O on Spark, and H2O is um, the the main platform uh, that that uh, comes along with this. On your uh, right hand side, you're going to see driverless AI, and driverless AI is the closed source platform. It's optimized for running on GPUs and provides essentially a full pipeline for machine learning practices. So, uh, we're going to do a quick talk about H203 first. So, what is H203? It's very similar to uh, scikit-learn in the sense that it is a, a library. Uh, it comes with many, many algorithms. It's got a, a, a DNN. It's got a, a random forest in there. It's got XGBoost as well as um, ensemble versions of all those, if you so choose. Um, also, it comes with AutoML, which is the equivalent of a very highly optimized and powerful grid search, um, if you guys are um, familiar with, with the term. And usually, I hear a lot of boos for grid search. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's also written in Java. It's very fast, and it's optimized to run across uh, multiple VMs. So you can actually spawn up a cluster, and it runs all in memory. So this is just a uh, example of some of the the, um, the algorithms that we have. Um, as you can see, uh, we have a couple for clustering, dimensionality reduction, uh, word word uh, word devec for word uh, embed embedding, as well as some of the more predictable uh, predictable ones like. Uh, uh, GLM, Random Forest, um, XGBoost, you know. Uh, so this is this is a little bit of a simplified, a simpl simplified version of, of our pipeline. Um, essentially, you start with some data. Uh, it can be distributed in Hadoop on a uh, blob store like AWS or GCS. Um, the first step, uh, obviously, is uh, data munging. So it's going to be you ingest the data into some format, usually in memory, um, and you have to transform it. So it's going to go from a whole bunch of like columns and rows into something that you actually want to put into a machine learning pipeline. Uh, from there, uh, you are actually going to select your target and train some models. The output model is what you would ultimately predict on. Uh, so this is just a high-level architecture of uh, what H2O would look like running either on the cloud or on-prem. Uh, essentially, you have the data, which is going to be from a blob store of some sort or HDFS. Um, and then you have your H2O stack. Now, it's gonna, uh, options you know, for running the stack may vary. Um, but essentially, what you can do is once you get the data in, you have it for exploratory analysis as well as um, data munging, and then also prediction and training of models. So that's just a quick overview. Uh, we'll talk about driverless AI next. Um, I apologize if I'm talking a little too fast, but um, we can uh, go over any questions if you want some clarification on anything else. 
So with driverless AI, driverless AI is our enterprise product. It is really darn cool, if, if I were to say so myself. Um, essentially, what it does is it captures the entire machine learning pipeline, and it basically gives it to you. Um, I think the, the vision of H2O was always kind of to democratize AI and democratize machine learning. Um, yes, sorry. Uh, can you repeat that? Can you open that the last sentence as you said that it takes the machine learning pipeline and gives it to you? What does it mean? Absolutely. So um, I, I will continue on, actually. It'll, it'll be uh, following in just a second. <laughs> yes. So. Um, the, the idea behind H2O is always kind of to democratize and give access to everybody the, the ability to do machine learning. Uh, I think that's something that is really encompassed in driverless AI and the fact that we are able to package up the entire, entire machine learning pipeline and provide it to a customer. So if we move forward here, we can actually take a look at it's It's very similar to the, uh, the original. Um, machine learning workflow, but as you can see, uh, one kind of section has been blocked off, and that's what driverless AI does for you. Essentially, once you get your data, assuming that it's clean enough, meaning you know, you've know you gotten rid of some of the corrupted values, you've cleaned it up just enough so that it, it looks good, you know, there's a couple nulls maybe, but everything's about, about acceptable you can give that data to driverless AI, and driverless AI will actually do almost 99% of the feature engineering for you. And then after that, it will build a model on those new features and give you an output model that's even more powerful than something that you could have done in the same amount of time. Driverless AI can run in you know, maybe four hours and do the work of a Kaggle Grandmaster that was working for about a month. see here. So may, may I know that like to create your own models, you need to figure out how to put the infrastructure together, how to you know run your algorithm. Right? That's a lot of paperwork or like, mm -hmm. like infrastructure work to get it make it happen. Correct, yes. So I uh, it let me clarify here. Your question was that uh um, that uh, that the statement was that uh, it, it does take a lot of time to design a model, especially if you're ensembling it, right, where you have to train one model that then trains off another model, right? Um, creating features can be really difficult because you have to do everything in memory and, and you have to parse these, these you know, uh, drop random nulls or, or handle random exceptions that could come along. Um, this is all like more engineering and code based kind of stuff. But ultimately, what driverless does for you is it does all of that, right? So what you, all you have to do is kind of give it, um, you just basically give it data. And I know I'm oversimplifying a little bit here. Um, I, I do have a quick demo for you guys afterwards, so we, we can get a bit into the nitty gritty there. Um, but essentially, why is driverless AI great? It, it comes down to three things, really. One is that it's available for almost anybody. Right? I mean, anyone can write a couple lines in Python to call an API and say, hey, you know, um, driverless, go and do this. Do, get, I'm giving you data. Can you go ahead and give me something understandable out? Right? Two, it's, it's super accurate and it's super fast. Um, in most cases, it competes with the top 5 to 10% of Kaggle, uh, Kagglers in any competition and in far less time, hours compared to weeks. Um, and also, the last thing is interpret interpretability. Excuse me. Um, we package it with something called MLI, uh, Machine Learning Interpretability, which basically will take any of our models and build surrogate models on top of it that are easy to explain and also easy to understand. So that when you have to go to your CEO or C-level exec and say, "Hey, I made this model. It does things," they're not going to look at you and say, "But why?" And and, and you're not going to be able to say so. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, with, with uh, neural nets, it can be really, really complex because even if you know why certain weights changed, even if you know the algorithm that is changing those weights, a lot of it comes down to you don't necessarily know the full reason why the net decided to do it, other than the fact that I gave it a ton of data and it made a decision for me. And now look, it's, it's saying that you're sick, but I don't know why, right? 
Am I, I think I'm going backwards. Okay. I, yeah, I, um, I was trying to be fancy and so that I don't block the screen like this, but it seems that I have been beaten in my own game. So, um, so yeah, so we're, I was just talking about accuracy. This is just another slide. It basically is telling the same thing, is that, that in, in most cases, we actually do really well against um, known data sets. So like a lot of them, are, uh, we, we benchmark ourselves against Kaggle because Kaggle has some of the best minds in the world competing. In fact, I mean, we've hired, what, five, five out of the top 10, I believe, um, and, and, and decided that they're, um, they're gonna build our product, right? Um, so uh, this is a little bit more about feature generation, um, which is uh, one of the, the core things about driverless that, that actually makes it that much better. Um, it does a lot of the, the statistical feature transformations for you. So it'll handle text. It'll do frequency encoding or, or um, categorical um, uh, encoding. It'll do clustering and, and create, um, uh, create labels based on those clusters so that you gain all the more inference out of your, out of your uh, data without actually having to write the code to do it. Um, and then ultimately, you can deploy it. So what ends up coming out of uh, driverless AI is uh, either a mojo, uh, which is a memory optimized Java object, pojo, which is a plain old Java object, or you can get a Python scoring pi uh, package. And these are all easily deployable. You, can put it on any machine, basically, and have it as a real-time score. You can also use it for batch predictions. So um, these are just a, a couple of things that uh, we've been working on with IBM. Uh, I know that uh, Leonard did mention Fiddle. And interestingly enough, the first thing on this slide is about Fiddle. So we uh, were working very closely with the Fiddle team in the last, um, I don't know, maybe month or so. Uh, to get a deployment of H2O, uh, our open source, on Fiddle. Um, so now you can go to the, uh, the Fiddle repo. You can actually go in, deploy Fiddle on your Kubernetes stack, and then deploy H2O jobs as if it was any other job um, that you would want to deploy via Fiddle. So uh, you can train, train models uh, on H2O get them, save them, and it would be very much the same uh, steps as using any of the other uh, machine learning pipelines that they have in, in the product. Um, and then also one other thing for uh, IBM Cloud Private. Now, IBM Cloud Private is obviously not um, open source. Uh, we are now offering, um, or rather we are prototyping and developing the um, driverless AI offering onto uh, ICP. And, uh, I just wanted to show you because it is really exciting. Um, essentially, ICP is also on Kubernetes. It's a, uh, a Kubernetes um, deployment in which you would be able to put any of the other machine learning stacks on. And, uh, and so we will now have, uh, or very soon, have driverless AI on uh, IBM Cloud Private. What's the price per model going to be? Uh, price per model, sorry? What's the price? How uh, much? So the, the pricing does vary. Um, obviously, don't really want to talk about uh, cost exactly. Um, but uh, the cool thing is that we're actually coming up with uh, a lot of new uh, value propositions for the person who do doesn't maybe want to spend you know, $100,000 on a license. I I'm making that number up. Uh, but uh, the cool thing is that soon, soon to be coming is that we have actually cloud offerings already for bring your own license, and, and soon to be coming, we've actually de determined a pricing model for just deploying a pay-as-you-go or pay-per-hour offering on the cloud. So AWS, Azure, Google, you can take your pick, basically, and you will have the ability to deploy an instance. It can be as powerful as you want. You can spend you know, money on eight, eight P100s if you really want. Um, and then as soon as you're done with your training, you can actually just shut it down. Um, and then the next step would obviously be if you wanted to in, uh, run inference, which you don't necessarily need eight P100s for. Um, <laughs> you probably don't need GPUs at all. So uh, you could actually spend a lot less money on inference once you've actually got the model trained. Yes, sir? Um, do you support uh, the TPU um, Actually, so it is a work in progress. Um, so we work very closely with the GCP guys, um, and it is definitely something that has been talked about, and 
and considered. I don't know specifically where we are on that, um, that stage yet, but it is definitely something that we would love to have going eventually. Yeah. So, um, as I promised, I'm going to do a quick demo here. Um, sorry, one more question, yes? Yeah, I wanted to know what um, current applications are we seeing in those cases? That is a fantastic question. Yeah, um, so actually let's do this. As I'm going through the demo, uh, we can actually go over some of the use cases because I think it'll uh, tie very nicely into this. So um, right here we have basically um, a running instance of driverless AI. Now this is running on AWS, guys, so um, it's not running my, from my computer. That way you don't hear the whirring fans too much. Um, and we have a couple data sets loaded. Now um, to start with, basically driverless AI is what we would call you know, a turnkey solution. It's supposed to be available for everyone. It's fairly easy to use. We, we give you a GUI um, if you want, or a Python client for those more apt to code. Um, from here, you can basically ingest data from several different sources, S3, uh, Google Cloud Storage, Google BigQuery, which is a data lake, um, Hadoop, if it, you have it set up, or just the standard file system. Um, now, I actually have data already in, ingested, so we're just gonna go ahead and start with that. From here, we have a couple different options. You can describe the data. So that basically is gonna do something very similar to um, pandas.info, or pandas.describe, excuse me, um, uh, which is basically giving you kind of some information about each of the columns and each of the rows. Um, sometimes it's very helpful. <laughs> um, you can also do uh, visualize. So AutoViz is um, a package that comes along with a, uh, driverless AI. Basically what it does is actually gives you um, graphical plots to tell us just a little bit more about the data without actually having to do any kind of, um, what, well, all the coding was done for you. As you can see, I just clicked it and it went. Um, so uh, this one is an outlier plot. Uh, basically what it's giving you is a couple dots per specific column as far as uh, what the outlier was, what the value was, and you can actually click on it and it'll tell you inside the, um, tell you the row, so you can actually take a look at it. Um, and you can actually go to, um, kind of browse and see what's going on, why possibly it could be um, an outlier. Uh, either maybe there was a null, maybe there was um, a mistype or a typo or something like that, right? And you can browse through this for all the columns and, and you can do this for every single uh, column that you have and every single plot that we have here as well. So, uh, and now we get to the kind of bulk, the, the meat and potatoes as I would call it, which is the prediction. So, uh, this is a, a fairly, um, fairly, I would guess, say famous data set. This is the airline's data set from uh, a while back. I believe it was hosted on Kaggle. But basically, the target is um, whether or not arrival was delayed. Now, uh, the idea here is that we go ahead and click target, and we say, OK, was arrival delayed? And what that does is actually gives us a, um, a little bit more in the GUI. It tells us options of whether or not you want to use GPUs. I could turn off GPUs, although we may not want to do that. Um, It'll also give us, um, the, uh, it'll tell you whether or not it's a classification. In this case it is, it's a binary, is it a classification or not? And then it also gives us a little summary of what's going on. So if I, as I tune the knobs, and you may not be able to see this in the back, but as I tune the knobs up or down, it'll actually change the summary just to tell us whether or not something, uh, how the model is going to be done, what's going to be actually run, um, all the important things that you might wanna know before actually starting a model, right? Um, in this case, we actually have to drop a lot of columns. Uh, there's things like air time, which are uh, arrival time, which would be very, very highly correlated with whether or not um, whether or not arrival was delayed. Um, tail, tail number is fine. So there's there's a bunch. Uh, air time, arrival delay, departure delay, uh, cancellation code, diverted, carrier delay, weather delay. I apologize, I'm gonna click through a lot of things here. Whether or not it was canceled, taxi out, taxi in. Okay, departure time. That looks just about right. And basically from here, we can simply select our score. So in this case, we'll use area under the curve. Um, now this, this is a metric that is very much tunable by the, by the user. You will want to pick what you want for um, the specific problem. So in the case of regression, you may want to use RMSLE versus RMSE, um, depending on whether or not you want to punish for overprediction. Um, once you start running, 
what you get is the runtime screen. It's basically telling you what's going on at the time. So you can take a look um, as as the as the machine starts to run the experiment, you'll see some progress come over here. You can also take a look at GPU usage um, as, it's, um, as it starts to spin up and use the GPUs. You can look at gain, lift, um, precision versus recall uh, graphs, the rock curve. Um, and as you can see, it's starting to change things here, uh, which, is, which is basically saying that I'm, I'm doing things. Um, and as it starts to populate, you'll see uh, variable, variable importance change as well as the actual scores. The metrics will be over here. Now, uh, while this is going, I'm actually just going to show you a completed one. Um, okay, so internet. Um, as you can see here, uh, you can take a look at what the overall progress of, um, of your experiment has, um, has taken over time. And each of these individual lines, or rather, as you move from from this, this side over here towards here is each epic. And on a uh, four GPU box, you'll actually see four dots. Now, um, they might be like a little closer as you get closer to the top here, but um, basically that's each GPU training an ensembled model, right? Um, and you can see that like over time, your, your score is getting better as we progress through the iterations. Um, so to talk a little bit more about, you know, like use cases here, um, this is really good if you're you're trying to understand like maybe when you want to stop, right? Uh, you you may not need 99% accuracy. You might think that oh I'm running for too long. I just need to get the model 97 is good enough, right? Um, now a lot of our a lot of our customers right now um, we have quite a few in the financial vertical. We also have a, a quite a few in the healthcare vertical. Um, and what I was talking about towards MLI is actually super important for those verticals specifically because of uh, one very important thing, which is that if I were to tell you I'm denying your loan and, I, and you ask why, and I tell you because my machine said so, you've got a lawsuit on your hands. So we've got this, we have MLI. So machine learning interpretability. Um, and while the, the other experiment's running, we can talk about this because this is really, really cool. Um, basically it gives you the opportunity to train a bunch of different models. Um, so we do, uh, we do, uh, we use like Shapely, Klime, as well as a, a couple other um, packages to give you this dashboard, which does look like I think um, way better on this screen than on mine. So uh, first things first is you can actually take a look at each of the individual points here. So if I highlight one point, it's actually telling me the reason codes behind why a specific um, row had the specific output that it did it, to a certain degree. It, so it was, um, it was it, as a result, and this is a different data set, I apologize. This is actually for um, a diabetes data set. So this has been um, a, a data set as to whether or not you were readmitted based on some, uh, um, uh, some data about how the, uh, or some data about the patient, essentially. So you can see that based on a certain, um, having a certain uh, medicine, uh, that was that was actually positively influence, influencing the prediction versus um, having a specific diagnosis. The second diagnosis actually was not so great to uh, to predicting whether or not they they actually needed a return. Um, at the bottom here, you can actually see a decision tree. So the decision tree is actually just telling you what path. Basically, it's it's the same idea behind um, any decision tree, which is just telling you why did I make that decision at a certain point in time? I decided to go left versus right. Why did I make that decision? Well, because of that specific diagnosis, diagnosis three in this case. And as you follow the tree down, you can actually see where that specific point took. Uh, you can also take a look at feature importance for the specific point, and it will vary if I click a different one. Um, slightly, usually, is the case. Um, but basically what it's telling you is based on a feature importance of one, like one being the highest, what were the five or six most important features um, and you can scroll down a little bit. It'll tell you that the, the least important one happened to be uh, whether or not they had some other drug in them at the time. Um, so that there is MLI. Uh, there's a ton more to see with this. So if you have any other questions, we're happy to answer them. And so now we can come back and take a look at our experiment running. It should have given it a, at least a cycle or two. So as you can see here, um, it's starting to build up the... Uh, 
the the rock curve it's starting to show us a couple outputs as far as like the initial models that were trained and it's telling us that there's some variable importance here now um, essentially all of these at this point should be mostly from the data set initially uh, once you start going to epic number two and three and so on and so forth you'll actually start to see more and more of the generated features that were created by driverless start to pop up um, the last thing that's basically user tun tunable is, and I kind of glazed over this initially when launching, is this right here. So you have accuracy, time, as well as interpretability. Uh, interpretability, the higher it is, means the more simple the model will be because you want it to be more interpretable. Uh, time going up means let, let the model run, let it go. Uh, and accuracy meaning just how close to 100 do I want to try and get? Like, do I allow it to run longer in order to get slightly better score, or do I run it a little bit less and allow it to be maybe not quite as predictive? So that is the, uh, the, the demo, the quick overview that I have. I don't want to hold you guys for too long, but if anyone does have questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Yes? So if you try to DIY to have, take the data and do this kind of thing, like, does that take a lot of like, Engine resources to put that together. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, so this in itself. Absolutely. Uh, that is a fantastic question. The answer is yes. It, it does take a very long time. Uh, in fact, uh, quite a few of our Kagglers have. W w uh, if anyone is a Kaggler, will will know that you know they they have month long to two month long competitions for a reason. They're not. Um, short by any means, um, and the reason is is because it takes a lot of time. It, it takes time to understand the features, to to determine why a specific feature was valuable or not. Um, we have an iterative process that basically creates features and then decides whether or not those features are good, and then dumps some of them and keeps the ones that are good, and then trains some more features, and then trains a new model on top of those new features. So it's very much a learning process for driverless AI, the same way it would be. But the only thing is that GPU boxes are doing it rather than one human brain. Um, another, uh, I guess in the back there, yes? Uh, so uh, this would work only with uh, models that you want to do prediction. What happened with the, uh, something like on top of learning that you want to uh, do some cluster or discovery on your data set? So uh, driverless AI is, um, does need a target. That, that is um, part of the, the value add here. Um, now, if you're interested in unsupervised learning, I would actually suggest our um, H2O uh, open source is, is very, very powerful at that. And, and the algorithms are all very much more optimized um, towards, uh, towards that. Uh, gentleman in the back. Does H2O open source or driverless AI uh, have any ability for dealing with class imbalance? Um, yes, yes, yes. There is actually. Um, there's. I. I believe there's a. There's so. There's inside the configuration file. You can actually set um, to detect a certain level of class imbalance. Um, absolutely. Uh, I know that it's in there. I, I couldn't point it to you exactly on the screen at the moment. Uh, yes, sir. If I have a very confidential data and then I, but I want to use the H two, <laughs> and then what will happen? Because I don't want to upload it to AWS. I know it's maybe simple, but I don't want to. Sure. Talk uh, the good news is, is that you can actually, I mean, you can, this is running on AWS right now. Uh, you can run driverless on-prem. You can run it on your laptop and through Docker. You can run it on GPU boxes if you have one. Um, and, and, and you can lock it behind a firewall. I mean, these things don't, uh, this, this software doesn't need the internet to work. Okay. No. Yeah, or yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, anything else? Okay, I think in that case, uh, we'll let you guys go just a tad bit early and then enjoy the rest of the evening, uh, except that Maya has something. I do, sorry. Before you go, and thank you so much, Nicholas. That was awesome.